Today on the Uniweb Interview Show, I'm joined by Rich Ryan, author and editor. Rich, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, you have written uh, some books based off the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, right. um, and you've taken your own spin on it, correct? Correct. So is was this your first... Uh, foray into writing novels was with the Sherlock Holmes or was this uh has this been a long time coming uh it's been a long time coming I must have tried maybe 10 or 12 different novels over the years and you know you get to a point and then you just never finish it and yeah I was getting close to retirement okay and uh I wanted to get a new laptop and I just you know made a promise to myself that this is I'm going to start a book and finish it yeah and that was the Vatican cameos. That was the first one. That and when did that come out? Uh, two thousand seventeen, September seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. Did you did you self publish that? Or no, was that... it's published by MX Publishing in London. MX Publishing. How did you go about finding the the publisher? And uh, first off, let me ask this because I'm interested in this. Okay. So with the Sherlock Holmes stuff, is it like with um, writing like? Uh, stuff about Camelot and that kind of thing? Is it like property that you can... It's all now in 2020, uh -huh. everything that Sherlock Holmes will be in the public domain. Public domain. And the only things that there's like two or three stories that are waiting to come into the public domain and they deal with Holmes basically at the end of his life, the end of his career. So if you're going to do an older Holmes as they did a few years ago in the film Mr. Holmes with uh, Ian McKellen, yeah, you, know, you definitely need to get permission from the Conan Doyle estate. Okay. And I got permission from the Conan Doyle estate for my first book. But, you know, basically the judges have told them, you know, you, you can ask for whatever you want, but you're really not entitled to anything. <laughs> right. So I just got, you know, it's a, it's a nice thing to have on a jacket, but of course a nice piece of change and you really don't derive any benefit from it except that little circle that I'm not sure people are looking for anyway. Right. Well, I mean, the name Sherlock Holmes carries uh, a lot of weight. Yes. It's it's one of the great pieces of literature. Um, and before we started recording, I told you how much I love the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. Uh, have you always been uh, interested in Sherlock Holmes or was this just like, you have been? Yeah. So what was it like? How did you come about with the Vatican cameos? How that As start? I said, I, uh, I was determined to write a book and... Uh, I don't know what happened there. I'm in the middle of my own screen. That's okay. I can still see you. You're good. Okay. Uh, I, was determined to write, I was determined to write a book, and uh, it seemed to me, you know, one of the easiest jumping off points would be what they call the untold tales. You know, throughout the canon, Watson makes references to all these other adventures that Sherlock Holmes had, right. but he never elaborates. And maybe the most famous one is the giant rat of Sumatra, which right. is... There's probably about eight different versions of that out at a minimum. And the Vatican cameos, uh, you know, my background is in medieval literature. My background is in re the Renaissance period. And it seemed to me, you know, I had this inkling that I could do something with Michelangelo and uh, Leonardo da Vinci and the Borgias. And, and it all fell together nicely for me. Wow. You know, when, I was, when we're talking about the writing style, it, it's... The way that uh, Sir Conan Doyle laid out uh, the adventures of Sherlock Holmes was like my, it, it's still mind blowing to me. I recently read the collected stories uh, a couple years ago, and it was it was just mind blowing the the thought processes that go into it. Was this something that felt like it came naturally to you writing that, or was that did you find that difficult to? Were you trying to imitate or emulate uh -huh. that style? I I am de consciously trying to imitate that style, and I think as each novel passes, I get closer and closer to it. Yeah. And uh, the first novel, if, you know, if you're familiar with the canon, two of the novels are what I call backloaded, a study in Scarlet and yeah. the Valley of Fear, where you, know, you, you have the mystery and Holmes solves the mystery, and then basically the second half of the book is the villain's story. Mm -hmm. And then he wraps it up at the end. And it's, Holmes is absent from the book. Right. But literally, like half the book, where you get the villain's side of what happened and what made him do what he did and everything else. Right. 
So I, in the Vatican cameos, I wanted to avoid that. So what I did was I set up alternating chapters. So each odd chapter is Holmes in 1901, and each even chapter is from Michelangelo's point of view in 1501. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, it was well received. Even, you know, uh, one or two people objected, but the overwhelming majority seemed to, you know, seemed to like it. And then the Stone of Destiny, uh, I did it a little bit less. The Druid of Death, less again. And in the upcoming book, The Merchant of Menace, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's as true to, to Conan Doyle as I can be. It's, it's all Watson. There's no shifting point of view. There's no time shift. It's all Watson. Just like right, you read you know, in the Hound of Baskervilles. Right. So in in uh, Holmes is such a unique character because I feel I really feel like he's one of the first anti heroes. Right. You know, he's like he's the he's the guy that he's not necessarily because he's like doing drugs. You know, you find him in an opium den, like right. hanging out, <laughs> like this guy who's got these super power, super deductive powers. Right. But he's also kind of like a little bit on the lower rungs of society. Mentally, like mentally, he feels that way. Um, but he's also a super genius. Right. Um, but with that character, I feel like there's so many things you can build off of. Yes. Yeah. You could take, you know, and, and, and people have, they've taken him a million different directions. Right. You know, and you know, one of my, one of the many hats I wear is I'm an editor for MX mm. and, uh, I always tell people, you know, that it, it's, it's like a coloring book, you know, they have the outline of the drawing. And I said, that's, that's the canon. We don't care what colors you use. We don't care what combinations you use. But you got to stay inside the lines. For the most. <laughs> yeah. Don't go too crazy. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know. Yeah. So MX is, so you, you also edit for them. Yes, I do. Was that, was that a relationship you had before you you wrote the books? No, that came after. You know, the, uh, the Vatican cameo has turned out to be one of the best selling, if not the best selling single book he had. And, wow. Uh, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I'm outsold by all the anthologies, but then I'm sure. up against 33 authors in one book, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this, uh, you know, I mean, I got one big benefit. I, I, I had become acquainted with Lee Child. Yeah. And uh, he was kind enough to read the Vatican cameos and give me a blurb that ended up on the cover. And I, I think wow. that helped a great deal. Yeah, it never hurts to have somebody like Lee Child's... Uh give you give you a nice word he's right. got some he's got some clout in the yeah, business yeah i just finished i just finished his latest book this morning <laughs> Jet, the next jack reacher book yeah past tense it's called that's pretty cool how did you uh, how would you go about meeting lee childs i was i worked for a newspaper and uh -huh. uh, one of the things i did i was primarily an editor but i always wanted to be writing so i did a uh, home video column that was nationally syndicated Mm -hmm. And when they brought the Jack Reacher movie to uh, DVD, they yeah. asked me if I wanted to interview Lee Child. And I said, all right. You know, and I interviewed him, and, you know, I had to call him. And I put the number in my phone, and literally, like, five years later, I said, gee, I wonder if I sent him an email or called him, if I could send him the book and maybe get a blurb. And sure enough, he still had the same phone number, and he was very kind, very, very kind. Oh, that's so cool. I... I, would, I need to get some phone numbers. I've been reaching out. To, <laughs> the, the, the big time celebrities don't usually respond when you reach out to them on Twitter. That's pretty neat <laughs> that you had Lee Childs do that for you. And you got to interview him. Did you guys talk a lot about um, um, Jack Reacher and yeah. this, the peop, the person who was actually playing Jack Reacher in the movie? At that time, Tom Cruise? Yeah, yeah I kind of took him to task for that one. Yeah, I love Tom Cruise. I think he's a great actor, but not he's not Jack Reacher. No. And uh, I think, you know, I think Cruz primarily had that almost kind of in, in the back pocket where, you know, you make a Mission Impossible movie and while they're writing the next script, you can always go make a Jack Reacher movie. Right. And he did, too. And apparently he's not going to do the third. They're recasting the third Jack Reacher movie. I don't know who okay. Jack Reacher is yet. Yeah, because when I when I saw the movie and I've read the books, I, I, I really enjoy the books, too. It yeah. just it definitely didn't match up. That's a that's really neat though. With um, 
there's been so many iterations of Sherlock Holmes in television and movies now. Do you feel like they do a pretty good job with the actors who portray him? You know, uh, there's a thing coming up called the Great Sherlock Holmes Debate. Uh-huh. It's going to be an online thing. It's going to be held in England. And uh, my publisher asked me if I would basically defend the TV show Elementary. Oh, wow. And, you know, so I'm going to you know, argue the case for Johnny Lee Miller and Lucy Liu as Holmes and Watson. Really? Yeah. I didn't even know that one was, that one was going on. I mean, I knew uh, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Cumberbatch. And uh, there's another one too, right? And then obviously, Sherlock. oh, yeah. Rich Sherlock has come. Yeah, there's a yeah. Sherlock on HBO, right? And there's this, so many of them. Yeah, as I say, you know, it, it's a cottage industry, right? That's interesting. Um, so, in terms of your, in terms of your, uh, the people you've looked up to in writing, I know you said you were editing for a newspaper and that kind of thing, right? But you always wanted to write. What were some of the stuff that inspired some of the books that inspired you? Besides uh, Sherlock Holmes, obviously that <laughs> that you were like. Oh, well, one, one of my one of my all time favorite books is The Princess Bride by William Goldman. Yeah, and uh, I like that. But as I say, you know, I was a medievalist, so I mean, I look at Shakespeare, I look at Chaucer, you know, and you know, I'm I'm the kind of guy that enjoys that thing, you know. Yeah, and. Uh, Contemporary authors, I, I, I've really grown fond of Daniel Silva with the uh, series that he's written. Ben Coase is another guy that I like a great deal. Uh, I think of who else? Stephen Hunter. Do you know Stephen Hunter? Uh-uh. You've you, you got to check him out. You would enjoy him. If you enjoy yeah. Richie, you'll enjoy He's got three generations. His, his first hero, they made a movie called Point of Impact with... Uh, Mark Warbeck, and they actually the name of the movie was Shooter. Yeah, okay, and I know they you're talking about. Figured it recently is a TV series with uh, Ryan Felipe, I believe. Okay, but uh, he had a he had a, a hero called Bob Lee Swagger, who was a Vietnam sniper, and then he he wrote seven or eight books about Bob Lee. Then he went back and he wrote about Bob Lee's father, Earl Swagger, who was a Marine during World War II and became, you know, a policeman after the war. And then he recently went back, his most recent book is called G-Men, which is about Bob Lee's grandfather and how he was one of the first FBI agents. Uh -huh. So it's an interesting kind of saga there. I love his stuff. Yeah, I'll have to check him out for sure. Um, I'm interested, too, in the whole, in the, whole uh, the route you've, you've taken. So it sounds like you've been in, in some form of literature, writing, editing uh for the majority of your professional life right. correct when it came to trying to find a publisher did did you find it difficult at all or was it something that like you already had contacts and no i, I found it difficult i i had sent out you know the uh query letters to american publishers and then you know i, I was keep getting rejections uh, i got a funny story about that in a second so, yeah, you know, after about 30 rejections from here, looking for an agent, uh, I said, let me go to London. I said, maybe maybe they'll appreciate Holmes, you know, a little bit more. In yeah. Britain. So yeah. I sent it to two different publishers, MX and the second publisher. And uh, MX got back to me two days later and said, you know, we'd like the book. And I said, OK, great. And about a day or two later, the other publisher got back to me and said, we really like the book. We're going to kick it upstairs and have our, you know, next level evaluators take a look at it. It's too late. Yeah, it's already taken. Yeah, but the uh, the funny story was, you know, you send these things out. This is for this is for all people that struggle with rejection. Right. You know, you send the letters out and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait. You know. So in the meantime, I find MX. The book gets published. It's doing as well as you know a small indie press book can do. I think. A year after the thing is published i get a rejection letter from an agent that says you know it's not quite right for us and i'm thinking you know if you waited that long wouldn't you at yeah. least check amazon to make sure it didn't get published in the interim? Yeah. and i actually got two of those <laughs> oh wow so as i say you know it's it's amazing how long these people can take to get back to you yeah 
Well, it, it also speaks to the just the, the sheer number of people who are trying to get published. Well, that that's that's the other thing. I think I just read an article yesterday, you know, and the guy basically thinks that self-publishing is going to flame out. Really? Yeah, he said that, you know, uh, what he thinks is going to happen is, you know, the only ones that are going to be able to self-publish, in his opinion, are the ones who can afford to self-publish. Yeah. They're going to be able to afford to buy the media ads. They're going to be able to afford to, you know, pay the extra fees and everything else. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it's kind of, I guess, survival of the fittest in the printing world. Yeah, it is. Um, survival because, of the Well, yeah, you already have to have kind of like backers almost if you're going to self-publish um, or if you're going to try and make it your full time. Right. Because and, and to, to try to move at a pace that becomes lucrative is tough in self-publishing because uh, it really helps if you're able to pump out books every six months or so yeah. as an indie published author. But you edit on the side as well. So you do you do some editing for people. Right. Um, it can be expensive. Like the, not the cost of the cost of getting your book published isn't just like, you know, having a Microsoft Word account and then having an Amazon account and right. putting it on there. Like you obviously have to get some professional editing, get a book cover done. Right. Um, and that doesn't even take into the account any kind of advertising or marketing right. that's exactly. gonna, that's going to go on. Um, what have did, did MX kind of take care of all the marketing and stuff for you? They or? do. Yeah, yeah, they handle all that. Because I will say there is the, like in, right now. Unless you're with a big time publishing house in the, the United States, right. a lot of the authors I talk to have to end up doing their own marketing still. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of my own marketing because, again, he's in Great Britain. You know, he, he makes an outreach here. You know, yeah. It's on the Barnes and Noble website. It's on the Amazon website. It's on Kobo. It's on iBooks, you know. Yeah. But again, I'm not his only author, you know. Right. And he's pushing, you know two or three books every month. So again, it's incumbent upon an author, even for a small press, to do a, a large degree of marketing. And, and for your marketing too, I'm always curious to wonder or ask this, how often do you get out into the local community or just community in person, like physically get out there and do stuff? I try to do it as often as I can. One of the most enjoyable things is book clubs, you know, because you, yeah. you're basically preaching to the choir. They've read the book yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, most of them like it, you know, hopefully. Right. And, <laughs> they wouldn't show up if they did. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know, and you usually get a free meal out of the deal. Yeah. But I think that's something that we have to, like, a, a lot of indie pub publishers or people who publish uh, independently don't realize is no matter what, getting out physically ourselves and putting in some legwork is involved in marketing a good book. Oh, sure. You know, I think that that gets that gets lost. I mean, it got lost on me completely when I published my book right. that I have to actually go out and do something now. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, all right, sitting behind the computer is done. You you did that for months. Now get out there and do something. Right. But that's the scary part, right? Like that's. Uh, well, yeah, I was a, I was a teacher before I joined the newspaper, so you know, getting up in front of an audience doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, it was kind of in your wheelhouse to yeah. get out there and do it. What a, what kind of well as an editor, it has to be difficult while you're reading your own work. Are you able to shut off that editor inside your head and just write? Yes, and for for about an hour or two, and then I usually go back and edit. <laughs> yeah, you can only shut them off for very small right. portions of time. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in the sense that a very good friend of mine, you know, is is born and raised in Great Britain, uh -huh. so I send it to her. And she picks out all the Americanisms that have managed to slip in. You know, mm. the biggest one I, I never knew this: the British do not use the word "gotten." Really? They, you know, we would say he's forgotten. Right. They just say he's forgotten. Yeah. Or he's huh. got. I got you. So so gotten. He, he says no one in Great Britain says "gotten." I said, okay. Huh. Not gonna argue. Yeah. I um I did this a while back, but like, do you ever listen to audible audible books with uh British author or British narrators? Yes. Does that I've I did that with one of my past books, um, and it helped. Like the the voice in my head as I was writing was that 
the narrator's one? voice. Right. Do you do that as well? Yeah, I have. A, my narrator is a, is a man by the name of Nigel Peaver. Okay, I, I feel like I've heard the name. Can't get much more British than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you, uh, you know, my publisher has a stable of, of readers. He sent me over four, four voice clips. They all read the preface in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And of the four, his voice just seemed to me the most, and I'm going to use a strange adjective here, the most Watsonian. Ah. I like it. <laughs> Creating your own. Yeah, because I, I know it can be tough. I mean, you sound like you're from uh, New York, right? Right. Yeah. So it gave me away. Your accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know it's got to be tough. I mean, and even to like try and think in a British dialect is interesting right. and it's fun. But I always I always feel smarter for some reason when I do it. <laughs> you do. You do. So how often do you write? Uh, when I get going, I, I usually write a little bit every day. You know, I will take, I get lazy and I'll take a month or two off between books. And, uh, but then once I get going, then I, I usually write just about every day. Well, let's talk about that. Cause, um, that's something that comes up a lot with writers okay. is the idea. And you said lazy, but it's also like, um, being in a, f in flow or, um, writer's block or whatever you want to call it. Like, is there, is there something you do specifically to inspire the urge to write the, the creative juices to start flowing? I need for me, I, I need to have, I'm not, not a plotter. I have a good friend of mine who plots out everything. He takes the big index cards and, you know, yeah. chapter one, I don't do that. I'm a pantser. Yeah. Same here. But, uh, I, I need to have at least a vision of where I'm going to go in my head. And so it's not that I'm taking two months off and doing nothing. I'm yeah. taking two months off and kind of mentally planning the next book without doing any writing. And then when I have a nice chain of events that stretches for more than three links, then I can sit down and write. Is it almost like you're, hol like you're holding images up in your mind and like waiting for one of them, like you're clicking the thing and like waiting for one of them to be like, that's the, that's the one. That's exactly <laughs> what I do yeah it's an interesting technique right because if I, I feel the same way if i can't if i'm not fired up about the thing it's hard to it's hard to write it's right. just not fun either right it's just like ugh. Well, you know and i'm always you know you look and you see these people you know i mean i i'm happy some days if i write 150 words yeah other days i'll sit down and i'll write a thousand words usually right. a thousand is about my max though you, know, you look at these people that are writing five thousand words a day and you say, man. It, it's mind-blowing, right? It's, it is. You know, you'd have a book done in a month. Yeah, I've, uh, I had a goal set for myself in the very beginning of writing at least 2,500 words a day. And I, I would usually hit 3,000 words a day. Okay. Um, and I would do it using um, word sprints where I would clock 30 minutes at a time and just write as much as possible. And it seemed to work okay as long as I had a vision, because I'm a pantser too, as long as I had the vision of where I was going. Right. If I don't have that though, it's all pointless. Yeah. <laughs> it's all it pointless. Is. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, that's what I said. I, I gotta I have to have that link, that chain at least start to take shape where I, I know, okay, we're gonna go here, then we're gonna go here, then we're gonna go here. And then, you know, I'm one of these people that well, deliberately, I paint myself into a corner, yep. and then I may have to take a week, ten days off, while I figure out how to get myself out of that corner. Yeah. And then you, then you're back, as you said, almost to the sprinting kind of thing. All right, now I know where I'm going, and you know, you get all excited, and you're back in the groove again. Yeah, well, that's kind of like where the magic of writing is, right? It's like, how the hell is he going to get out of this? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And as I said, you know, it, it it's, uh, you know. The problem with homes, it's not a problem, that's the wrong word. Uh, the difficulty with homes, if you will, mm -hmm. is, you know, to be true to the canon, you know, there can't be any uh, superhuman stunts. There can't be any, you know, last minute deus ex machina kind of things. You know, <laughs> he's, he's got to figure it out all by himself. Yeah. Using Using pure, like, incredible intellect. Yeah. To break it down. And I was going to ask you about that, too. 
um, when you talk about having a vision of where you want to go, I always I always imagine uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the, um, Conan Doyle was always doing like a um, would have an ending in mind and work backwards. Right. Because I can't imagine somehow like weaving forward in the in the story. Is that how you do? Is that how you do it though? Do you weave forward in the story? I weave forward. I yeah. I, I never know how they're going to end until I get there. And then I then as I said, then it ends up taking a week, ten days off, and I say, all right, now I can end it. I got an idea. Yeah. Did did you do any kind of uh, looking into how he wrote the stories of Sherlock Holmes? Is there any is there any information about how he did that? Uh, you know, he there's no I've never never been able to see anything where he actually delineated his writing process per se. Yeah. But I, I I tend to think, as you said, you know, uh, with him, it's it's almost like you can almost see the working backwards. You know, I have an ending. I know how I want it to finish. So how do I get there from the get go? Yeah. It it would make sense to me, but then again, like the the way Sherlock Holmes' brain works never really made sense to me. It was, right. and that's what was so interesting. It was like, how does a human? First off, I can't imagine a human brain working like this. So how the heck did an author, <laughs> how did he create somebody who was able to think at this level, you know? Right. And well, I, how the heck, how do you do it? Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the part that gets clever is you really kind of have to train yeah. yourself to think outside the box, yeah. you know? And uh, I'm, I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. It doesn't take me as long as it used to, but... You know, you, you have to look for something that, in a sense, is very, very obvious, and yet at the same time is going to be overlooked by 99% of the people, if that makes any sense. I mean, it's right out there. It does. It's it's like you're creating an illusion. Yes. Yes. It, it's almost like a magic trick where, you know, yeah. you're seeing it, but you might not be seeing what you think you're seeing. Yeah. And that's You're focusing on the other hand. That's kind of what, you know, I think Doyle did. And I know it's what I do. Yeah. You know, I, I want to lead you one way. I want to make you think something. And then I'll, I'll play fair. I always play fair with my readers. I mean, there's, there's deception, but in, sprinkled in the midst of deception is everything you need to know to arrive at the truth. Yeah. If you can't pick out the breadcrumbs, that's not my fault. <laughs> I think that's what was the beauty of uh, Sherlock Holmes was even though you would be amazed by the magic of his deductive reasoning and how he came to the conclusion, he would he would then explain exactly how he got there. And you would right. still be he would like you would explain the magic trick to you and you'd still be like, it's amazing. <laughs> you know, usually if, they, if the if the magician shows you the trap door, you're like, oh, I get it. And it's not right. amazing anymore, but. The thing that, that he was able to do, and it sounds like what you're doing is showing us the trap door, and it's still mind blowing that it's you're able to get there. I, I kind of I do. I show you the trap door. I tell you what's there, but at the same time, there might be another trap door that you're not seeing. Right. And if you're not seeing, it's because you're focused on the trap door I'm showing you, and not looking two feet to the left to see yeah. the other. One. That's so cool, man. How interesting. I'm, I got to get my hands on the book. Uh, I haven't unfortunately read it yet, uh, but I am like dying to read it now because I do. I do love me some Sherlock Holmes. Well, All if you, if you got to pick one, start with the Vatican cameos. That's my wife's favorite. Vatican and, cameos. Uh, yeah, the only thing I will warn, I warn people all the time is I got yelled at by one one reader. There's some adult content in there, as I tell them. I'll have to. I'll ask my mom before I read it. <laughs> I'll keep permission. Uh, but, but all the adult content is based on historical events. Okay. So think about that for a second or two. Well, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. Yes. In history. Yeah. Well, as I said, this was you know during the reign of the Borgias, as yeah. you know, and you know what they were like. I don't. You will find out. <laughs> I will find out. I can imagine raids typically aren't good. <laughs> right for for people involved so the <laughs> so the fourth one will be out soon and you're currently writing the fifth book right 
And I'll, I'll, how long are each books? Because a lot of the Sherlock Holmes were like short stories. Yeah. These... The, first, the first book was actually the longest. The Vatican cameos was about 72,000 words. And a uh, very good friend of mine, a really preeminent Sherlockian, read the book, yeah. liked it. I said, I, I have one bone to pick with you. And I said, what's that? He goes, it's too long. Yeah. But I'm going, 72,000 words, you know, it, it is not really all that long. And he pointed out that of Doyle's four novels, I think the longest is like 55,000 words. Yeah. So the next three have all been like right in the Doyle wheelhouse. And as I said, I'm trying to get close to his style in all aspects, including length. Yeah. Well, was it, wasn't it Shakespeare that said brevity is the uh, soul of wit? It did. Right? Yes. So he could have said brevity is wit. Yeah. You know. <laughs> keeping it brief but i think that's that's part of when I, we were talking earlier i think the style with which he brought to the to the table was like cutting the fluff and, and it was all just it was all just in pertinent yeah. information that's that's what i try it, it, it reminds me in a very real sense you know they talk about how spartan uh hemingway's prose is Mm-hmm. And that's what this reminds me of. As you said, you know, you can pick up so many other authors and you get pages of description and, you know, yeah. you don't get that with him, you know. Yeah. Because it's not Whatever. necessary, right? Like he focuses, the characters are necessary. Yeah. What's I mean, happening? The second book I wrote, The Stone of Destiny, mm-hmm. I, I got, you know, as I said, I was a medievalist. So I had a, a scene taking place in a castle and I got into describing the castle and everything. I was really, I liked it a lot. And yeah. my wife read it. She was, this is boring. She goes, this is good. This could go. Yeah. And, you know, I cut it all. They to... <laughs> uh, yeah, she, yeah she because I, I think I think that a lot of it's like we're not looking for a world to be built. It's already, it, yeah. it's more like we're living inside of Sherlock's head. Right. Yeah. That's pretty, that's interesting. And I have, I have seen some things from people um talking about how they'll just they'll they'll talk about it, how good a book is by the amount of pages they did not have to skip right and anytime I see, I see that like because my a lot of my writing is between like 65 to eighty thousand words right and that's just because i get bored very easily right. <laughs> and if i'm writing and i get bored with what i'm writing i'm like all right we need an explosion <laughs> or something well I, I just finished lonesome dove yeah. which is about 950 pages. Oh, and all I can tell you is it's a good thing I wasn't Larry McMurtry's editor on that book because it had only been about 500 pages by the time I got it. Oh, wow. You know, but it, it literally took me a month to read it. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, you pick up the Reacher book and I'm done in two days. Right. Yeah, be- and, and you're engaged the whole time. I think that's yeah. one of the, like, you want to engage readers. You don't... Right want them to feel like they're uh, falling off the face of the earth necessarily. I mean, we still want to tie them to something. Yeah, parts of the McMurtry book are absolutely brilliant. Yeah. But other parts, you just say, really? Come on. I mean, he has one character who is in the book for maybe 30 pages. Not essential to the main story whatsoever. Interesting character, interesting little uh, vignette. Yeah. But Cut it. Cut it, yeah. Well, as an editor, too, uh, would you, I mean, what are some of the essentials in terms of when you when you look at a first draft or a second draft that you're looking to take care of? Uh, you know, you're always looking for plot continuity. Right. And, uh, you know, you're always looking for, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a researcher by nature. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how many authors just kind of take history for granted where they'll say things and you know you you do the research and you say wait a second you know yeah. uh I'm, I'm editing a book right now and uh in it this guy is listening to a transistor radio in 1929 mm-hmm. be okay except the transistor radio wasn't invented until 1954 mm. <laughs> You know, you want to look out for that kind of thing. So unless he's a time traveler, it doesn't make right. any sense. Yeah. 
you know, you're on the lookout for that kind of thing. Another one, uh, it was a Sherlock Holmes book where uh, Watson was Watson was kind of like the hero in this book. And he infiltrates this club and he takes a bottle of Dom Perignon and he need, uses it to smash it over a guy's head. And he goes, you know, I hated to waste it. It was the good stuff, 64, which would have been okay, except they really didn't start bottling Dom Perignon until about 1910. Oh, wow. So I don't think it was the 1964 vintage. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and there's people, I mean, there's honestly, like yourself, that will find those things, that continuity, and it just blows the whole story for them. Yeah. It takes it takes them out of the world. Yeah, we, you know, as a newspaper man, you know, we always said the minute you make a mistake in a, in a news story, you, you've lost credibility with your readers. Yeah. And I, I think the same thing happens to a novelist. You know, if I'm writing, if I'm writing a news story, and I tell you, it took place on such and such a street, and I put it in the wrong community. Well, yeah. you're gonna say, well, if he can't get the street right, how do I know what else he he didn't get right? Right. And it translates over to novel writing as well. Yeah. Yeah, and with fiction, we're already asking people to suspend their belief a little bit. Right. But if we yeah. if we if we take it too far to where time no ma no longer even matters when right. things actually happen, then it's like, yeah, this guy is obviously just making stuff up. Yeah. Yeah, we want we would we want to be tricked, right? In a, in an authentic way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> we want to be tricked in an authentic way. Yeah, it is actually. Thanks. <laughs> um, keep that. That's the keeper. That's the keeper. I'm gonna put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> um, this is this is awesome, Rich. I I really appreciate your time on here. I want to ask. Uh, I always like to give the last word to the to the author. Um. What's so if you if you could leave us with anything, um, most important thing in your writing career, uh, what would it be? Just soldier on, you know, don't be discouraged, work at your craft. Uh, you know, we can all get better at what we do, and uh, if you practice and, and work and you're not self satisfied, you're going to get better, you're going yeah. to. Uh, you know, like anything else, you're practicing. Yeah. Just hone your craft. Hone your craft. That's it. I uh, was talking to somebody the other day. Perseverance is like a superpower, man. Just keep it on uh, staying in there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Rich, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank we, you. It is my pleasure. We can find all the uh, Sherlock Holmes mysteries uh, on Amazon, Barnes oh, & Noble. Uh, yeah, just search Richard T. Ryan. Put the middle initial in. Richard T. Ryan. Right. Gotcha. And uh, anywhere we can find you on, uh, we can find you on social media, on Twitter at Rick Ryan. Right. right? 52. 52. Are you on uh, Facebook? I'm on anything? Facebook, Richard T. Richard T. on Facebook. Right. Do you, have a, do you have a website? No, I've been thinking about putting one together. And again, procrastination, I, <laughs> we've already gone over my technological shortcomings. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Hey, but you, you've uh, you're you're almost on book five, which is amazing because it's only it's only been what two years since you started. Right. So yeah, that's three, because it took a year between writing the book and getting it to the publisher and getting it out. That was an extra year. So I started in, in uh, sixteen, I guess, or so fifteen, even maybe. Five books in three years is a is an accomplishment, man. Thank you. We'll be patient for the website. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put all the links to where they can find you in the description of the video. Rich, thanks so much for your time, man. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. You'll be well. You too, sir. Thank of you. Bye-bye.